morning. I was going to say good morning. I'm used to saying just good morning every time. 10 o'clock at night, just good morning. Uh, 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 thank you so much for having me here. Um, uh, God knows you guys do the work um, uh, uh, everywhere. And uh, thank, thank you so much for what you do on, uh, and being conscious of injured workers to us, to all of us. Uh, it is in the entanglement of DC, the entanglement of the FLCIO and the labor movement and everything that happens. Uh, sometimes we lose sight of why we became what we are. Um, that is to stand up and fight for those who don't have the ability to stand up and fight for themselves, uh, especially in light of uh, those who are supposed to fight. That is muscular, heavy, rich, well-organized corporations whose entire purpose is not what kind of life you're going to lead, but what kind of profits they're going to make. Uh, so having uh, people like Peg to be the consciousness to us in uh, what we do is uh, really important. So uh, really, uh, I want to tell you this. I don't like to do keynote speeches, so I hope you don't expect a keynote speech. I'm an organizer, and organizers don't do keynote speeches. <laughs> but I think... Uh, but I think we can conspire together. Um, I think we can uh, organize together. And I think we can envision things together. And I think we can finally decide that we control our own destiny. We control the, our own destiny as workers, as Americans, as citizens of the world, that the power within us is what's going to change our reality on a daily basis, not a messiah in the form of an elected official coming and fixing all that hurts us. Um, and I think for decades, I think that's what happened. We saw politics as our salvation. We don't do anything without calling it. We don't do anything without focus grouping. <laughs> uh, and my idea is, this is what I want to conspire with you. Instead of trying to adjust ourselves to those polling results and those focus group results, can we be the organizers actually who change the results of those pollings so that they adjust to what we think and what's right instead of us trying to fix ourselves to what the polling results say. So because we have a big election coming in front of us, it is important for all of us to take politics seriously. But at the end of the day, I just keep on asking myself, why do I do politics for if politics is not worried about me? Right? So we're just talking in here for a little bit. So. Uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if anybody from the Department of Labor is here. We have a fine Secretary of Labor. That's not. So was my dear friend Helga Solis. I don't know anybody with a better heart than Helga Solis. But if our ask for 2016 is going to be to presidential candidates, if we help you win, who your Secretary of Labor is going to be? We're going to get the same results that we have been getting right now. Our question should be, who's going to be your economic advisor? Who's going to be inside the White House? Who's going to stay in your ears and design how you govern this country? Not how you implement those designs through the Department of Labor or whatever departments there are. See, what happens is, it happens in the state level, it happens everywhere. Right-wingers get elected, and they walk us. <coughs> right? Just think about this. Scott Walker never campaigned to go after workers when he was campaigning. But the first thing he did after he got elected was come after workers. I'm not going to mention names of Democrats, but I have seen so many Democrats showing us their guns and blazing it and say, I'm going to come and fight for you. 
when elections are happening. The minute the elections are over, the guns go back to the holsters. Because I saw something outside. You have a postcard about Salaka standards. <laughs> to me, that's sad. That is sad that we have to counter the chamber. They had their eight years in the White House. This should be our time. We shouldn't be petitioning the, ch the, the Chamber of Commerce and fearing the Chamber of Commerce about what they're going to do with the administration. We walked, we found, we worked on to get elected. Because brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, we get what we demand for. And what do we demand? Do we just demand all the time to just have a, a chair at the table? Or do we want to leave that discussion at the table? Do we want to be the facilitators at the table? I think it's about time someday we want to be the facilitators at the table. Because all the safety changes we have, all the workers' rights changes that we have, that's when, when we had the muscle to actually facilitate that conversation and leave that conversation. And I happen to be one of those people who thinks we still can. We still can do that. But I think we can do that in our neighborhoods. We can do that in our living rooms. We can do that in our villages and cities and states, not in Washington, D.C., and trying to convince politicians. Because my goal is to convince their voters that's the right thing for them to do, not, turn, not convince politicians to do the right thing. That's what I see as an agenda-driven politics instead of politics-driven agenda. Because four years, what we have had is politics-driven agenda. If we do X, Y would come out of it. If we elect this person, then all our problems would be fixed. I think our problem is not just with politicians. Our problem is with voters not understanding what we care about, what's good for them. And if we focus back on voters, we focus back on our communities, then we'll get the results that we deserve. So, a couple of people mentioned Orange County. Uh, I, people told me when I went to Orange County that I was crazy to try to go to Orange County. Uh, Peggy told you, you know, the Jumper Society started in Orange County. They're still thriving in Orange County. They're still there. Uh, not only that, every bad thing that you know at the national level probably started in Orange County. It started. <laughs> and it, you can imagine it started from, from, from Orange County. The whole concept of paycheck deception came out of Orange County. The voucher system came out of Orange County. The National Taxpayers Association started in Costa Mesa, California, in Orange County. What else? You can't mention it, I'll tell you, it probably has its base. Came out of Orange County. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, all those, uh, Reagan called Orange County his country. Uh, Nixon was from Orange County. What, we can't keep on going and going, right? And I don't know if you watch uh, Guilty TV and watch uh, Real Housewives of Orange County. They are in Orange County. Right, those ladies who, you know, who nobody knows what they do for a living. They're drinking a martini all day long. Like they're swimming pool in their living room. Um, nice. That Orange County does exist. But what I found was for every one of those Orange County people you see on TV, there are hundreds of them who clean that pool, who clean their houses, who fix the bed, teach their kids, drive their kids to school, sometimes shopping. And those were the people we decided to activate and actually ask them to stand up and fight for what's right for them. Not only in the richest country in the country, uh, the, the, the richest country in the world, but also the richest county in the country, in Orange County. We saw kids being born in a motel and growing up in a motel. I don't know how many of you have seen the documentary on HBO, The Motel Kids of Orange County. Literally, they, their parents work at Disneyland, at the Disney hotels, and they live in cheap motels. They were born there, and they're going to high school age, living in a motel room. 
And that became the passion that I wanted to go and work in Orange County. And what I saw was when people were asked to join together and organize together and come together and conspire together and fight together, they can actually win. And that's what we did in Orange County. Not only people were coming together and bettering their lives, more people were winning, joining unions, which supported my union idea, union, the, the, the union mission. But at the same time, we were strengthening our bonds with the community, with clergy, and highlighting the issues that faces people on day on daily basis. So some of you probably have heard me talk, take the sto tell the story, but I'm going to tell it again because that's really what makes me get up every morning and go to work. Uh, the Teamsters in Orange County used to brag that they have the largest market share in Orange County than any anywhere else on trash pickup, sanitation work. And one day was uh, this guy, Ron Herrera, those of you from LA you know Ron. Uh, we went on a ride. And in Anaheim, California, uh, at the top sanitation place, uh, I saw hundreds of people walking in and walking out. It was a shift change. And I asked Ron, are they your members? He said, no. I said, do they factor into your calculation of you have 90% market share? 95% market share? He said, no. I'm like, then you're my as well. This are, this are sanitation workers. Then he told me this horrible story. He said they tried to organize them in 1998. The company called ICE, they got raided and they all of them were deported the next day. And the Teamsters had a chilling effect from that and they didn't want to touch that group of workers. And I started having a hard time falling asleep thinking about these people. And now let me tell you what they do on a daily basis. They show up in their shift, they clock in, in the Southern California sun outside, they line up on the sides of the shoes, uh, a belt which passes by, the trash <laughs> trucks come in, they, they unload their the black bits, the dirty, dirty trash. Everything that the dirty stuff that you put in. And with their hands for eight hours, they go through that looking for recycled clock lighters. They get one glove a day. They told us those gloves don't last more than an hour. So you can look at their fingers poked up. No one is supposed to throw their syringes into their trash, but people do. Right? They run into roadkill and everything else that goes into that trash. And I started having a hard time just letting it go because if we don't care about these people, what the hell are we here for? <laughs> so, so what we did was we activated our network of churches that we work with, which are about 50 of them clergy leaders, call them into a meeting. And the community, or the community organizations, a lot of them in Orange County that we work with out of our office. And we just presented, just to, we told them, like, can you help us organize these people? And I have never seen people just put their heart and soul into it. Not just the unions, the community people in the churches into doing this. So the clergy decided that they were gonna go to the company and confront them about what they did in the 90s. And they did. Company, of course, denied it. They said they don't do that to their workers. Then our clergy leaders asked them, can you sign on a piece of paper saying that you would not call eyes if they tried to organize that game? And they came, back, they came back with that piece of paper, which we treated like a neutrality agreement, that they're not going to call eyes on. So we called the Teamsters and said, let's go. And we got an agreement with the Teamsters that the community was going to lead this organizing campaign. Long story short, 
seven months later, 600 plus people who work at that sanitation plant, we used to work for a minimum wage. We used to get one bottle of water a day to work outside. That, the, 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 the heat. We didn't have any rights for more than one globe a day. By 74% voted to join the Teamsters. And today, those 600 class workers, they have two week vacations paid. They get a limited amount of gloves. They get to sit across the table with their employers and negotiate what is rightfully theirs. They have a safety committee which stands up and points out whatever is going on. And whatever the hell else they are doing, they are in control of their workplace. That is what the labor movement in the community would do when we are at our best. And we're far, far, far away from at our best. When we are at our best, when we do those kinds of things, we don't depend on politicians. We depend on each other, on our solidarity, and we win for people we can. So, uh, I don't know, probably read about this, so this is in the uh, top of my head, and I gotta talk about it. We have a very big deal going on in DC. The states. How many of you are familiar with TPP? Or fast track, right? Fast tracking of the TPP. Um, look, a lot of people are, including the president, are like unfortunately, including the president, are trying to paint us as the old school people who don't like any kind of trade. We want to close our borders, and we don't want to do that farther from the truth. On, um, along everything else that we fight for, we want things that lift us everybody up, instead of things that drag everybody down. We had a conversation a long time ago, and TPP came up with the administration about negotiating the next generation of trade agreements that lift everybody up. Lift workers in the United States up, lift workers with any uh, country that we do a trade agreement with. In good faith, we work with the administration to get that done. Unfortunately, they insisted in doing trade the old way, nothing different from NAFTA, CAFTA, SHAFTA, whatever we have been doing. <laughs> Nothing whatsoever different. And they want us to rubber stamp it because he is supposed to be our president. I am clear on one thing. I don't know, I'm not talking about the AFL-CIO. I'm clear about who I work for, who my loyalty is. I work for, for millions of workers whose wages are going down but still give a piece of their pay to pay my salary. I know who I work for. I know who I stand up for. I don't have any problem saying he's wrong when the president's wrong and he's dead wrong when it comes to the trade agreement. <laughs> to me, the hurtful thing is how much energy the administration is putting into this. If the administration had put 10% of the energy they are putting into this trade agreement, we would have had the employee free trade agreement. If the administration would have put 1% of the energy they are putting into this thing, into the Salaka standards and our safety standards that we wanted to improve, we would have a different America today. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Because you know what? I walked precincts, I formed bank. My brothers and sisters formed bank, and we elected change. We elected home, not the Chamber of Commerce. Not on this issue, not on any other issue, that the Chamber of Congress and the Business Round Table should not have a veto power over the president they never supported to start out with. So, if our purpose is to elect Democrats to just elect Democrats, 
We're getting what we deserve. I think there is a better way. I was just telling you, I just sent an email to my senator from this state. Senator Cardin, who is a fine man, who is a great man. He betrayed me on this issue. And I'm not talking again about for the AFLCA or for myself, for anybody that I'm going to vote on. This is the line. You vote for fast tracking this when you're not voting to fast track the minimum wage increase, that you're not voting to fast track unemployment insurance, you're not voting to fast track safety standards, you're not voting to fast track infrastructure in this country, but you are voting to fast track the old trade rules. To me, that's a permanent divorce. And I just sent that email to my senator telling him, there is no way in hell I will find anything he's going to do. I will ever vote for him. I'm not asking all of you to do the same thing. But I'm just saying, we got to find our line in the sand somehow, somewhere, someday. Because what happens is Republicans come and walk us, and the Democrats come in and they say, I'm not going to walk you like they used to walk you. I'm going to keep the status quo the way it is. Then we keep that status quo, then Republicans come in and they lower that status quo. And because of that, we're fast becoming like Qatar and Saudi Arabia instead of the America that we deserve and have. And I walked through a desert to come to this country. I risk my life to come into this country. And I have found my spot in the labor movement to sustain the, the country I risk my life for. And I will die fighting for what's good about this country and maintaining it for next generation of Americans. Because right now, we're on the verge of losing what makes this country great. That's a vibrant middle class. <coughs> That makes this country great. Um, you know, a lot of innovative things are coming out of actually our local governments instead of the national government on, on, on this kind of uh, uh, standards and this kind of things. Uh, when I was in California, for example, uh, we uh, were pushing for a joint liability legislation. Uh, for example, if you go stay in a hotel, the person who's, fixed, who's making your bed would be wearing a Hyatt uniform and everything else that looks like Hyatt employee, until something happens to you or to that person, the Hyatt says they are subcontracted from somebody else and they're not my responsibility. So we are the, trying to come up with the joint, the joint liability standards that Hyatt and everybody else is not passing on their responsibilities down and coming up with a new, their own innovative ways of avoiding whatever regulations and whatever responsibilities that they have for their workers. Uh, so again, uh, if we make that part of our agenda of why we elect people and hold them accountable on those things that we want them to fix, just electing people won't do it. That's what, well, that's what I'm talking about, about agenda-driven politics. What's our agenda? It's fine that what, what, what our agenda is. Fight for that agenda. Get people elected based on that agenda and help them govern on that agenda that they got, they, they got elected on. When, when Dr. King and those people used to do it, they mattered. They smarted up. They just let us march, and they on, march on doing the same thing they're doing. So how do we channel those marches into results at the end of the day. How about, right? a, how about a general strike? So that is, I think, I, 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 I think he said a general strike. Before we get into a general strike, because our neighbors are conditioned, if you go out on a strike, that's an advantage for them, they should go get you. That's why I'm saying we have to change the minds of our neighbors, the minds of our family members, the minds of people who go to church with us, the parents of our kids who go to the same school, about what kind of a future we can have together so that we can control the dialogue, we can control the narrative that's, that, that's out there. Because right now, we're losing the narrative right and left. Uh, so 
I support the national march, yes, I'm for it. But at the end of the day, there is an action plan attached to it that is gonna be, gonna lead us on year-round politics, year-round organizing, which is gonna help us get to where you want us to get. Probably one you've heard before. 15,000 Americans die every year from preventable asbestos-caused diseases. We need your voice. We need to ensure that whatever toxic reform bills passed has expedited action for not only asbestos, but BBTs. Can we count on you to raise your muscle, your arm, and your voice? Because we're going to be buried for the next 40 years if that bill passes as drafted. So I do. I'm raising my hand to tell you, yes. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't count, you, you, you can't count on me on, on doing that. And just look. I, I, I don't think we, we aspire enough. Uh, I don't think it is hard, or I don't think this is impo it is impossible in the country of ours, in a very, very rich country of ours, a country of innovation, to imagine, say, and demand that anyone who goes to work should come back in one piece to their home. I, no, I just, just, just simply, we can't, we, can't, we can't say that. If I don't have to go to work to breathe dirty air or whatever chemicals to come back home and sacrifice part of my life because I want to get a paycheck. So I think we can aspire for bigger things, but not just isolated by themselves. But in order to get there, we gotta aspire for a bigger democracy. We gotta aspire like, you know, who gets to vote in this country. You know, I don't know, some of you probably have heard me say this before. Why the hell do we have to even fill out a voter registration form in this country to vote? You know, I walk, you walk out of a hospital with a social security card. Why wouldn't that be enough? Who is it helping to actually for you to fill out an additional paperwork? We don't aspire enough to actually for bigger things, and I think, as a movement from the labor movement's perspective and the progressive movement's perspective, we really have to start thinking big and thinking the impossible is possible and trying to move things forward. Oh, one more question. And thank you all of you for what you do every day uh, here uh, in your cities, in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces. And really, thank you so much for what you do. And uh, I'm gonna close with this. So, um, one, if you don't follow me on Twitter, you should. <laughs> and if, uh, so, I just posted about something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, just posted an article today. Um, uh, you saw what happened with FIFA officials. Um, I am a passionate, passionate lover of the game. I love football, soccer, and it has been for too long led by thugs, literally thugs, and those of us who are close to the game, we never thought anything like this could happen to actually bust FIFA. But here's part of the story that you probably have not heard, and this should concern you because this is why you are here. And. I have been talking about it with the International Woodworkers Union has been talking about it, ITUC have been talking about it, but nobody cared, really, that 2022 World Cup would take place in Qatar. And just listen carefully, I'm gonna tell you some numbers. Exactly 733 soccer players will qualify maximum will qualify to play in that World Cup. So far, over 1,500 workers have died building the venues where those 700 plus players would be playing. In this space, by the time Qatar is done building the stadiums, over 4,000 Migrant workers, zero Qatars, migrant workers would die. 
I'm proud of our Justice Department for what they did. They went and busted those people because they cheated the United States of hosting the games. Can we bold, be bold enough to say, if the Justice Department has a power to do this because of a bribe, can not they do the same thing for real American values of being against slavery because slave labor is building those stadiums? I think we can. You know, Mr. Platter is gone. Some of the FIFA officials are gone. But let me tell you who runs FIFA. Adidas runs FIFA. Coca-Cola runs FIFA. Visa runs FIFA. If all of you just raise a concern with Adidas and the sponsors of FIFA, why are you going to go take your game to slave-owning country? We had one of the players we used to play in a club in Qatar, great player from Moroccan. We used to play in the British Premier, Premier League and got traded to go play, which it's funny, in soccer they call it Seoul. He got sold to a club in Qatar. And they would not even pay him his wages on time. And he wanted to leave. So they have this kafala system, which if you are a foreign worker going there, they take your passport away until your contract is over. He, a professional soccer player, could not leave the country because of passport. Now he's on a crusade, on a crusade to point this out about what kind of a system they have there. I don't think the US team should go play in Qatar. No. I think Visa, Adidas, Coca-Cola, and Budweiser, those four sponsors, can actually change the behavior of the Qataris. They can actually change the behavior of FIFA. If we all say, my little voice, my one email, one, my tweet, one tweet, one comment on Facebook can actually change things, because it does. And I'm begging you and asking you, because when workers' safety is not protected anywhere in the world, none of us can be safe to say, I'm protected. And on behalf of those migrant workers, I'm asking you to do something about it. Thank you so much.